Radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. And we're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but to the point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. A very good morning to you, it's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Today we look ahead to Prime Minister's questions, how the British government might thwart Elon Musk's plans for a free and open Twitter. And we see how British armoured ambulances are helping Ukraine and what's going on with our new points-based immigration system. All that to come after your morning headlines. A very good morning. It's 9.30. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. Poland has accused Russia's Gazprom of breaching its contract after gas supplies were cut to the country. Well, that's after Warsaw refused to pay in rubles. Gazprom is also threatening to cut off supplies to Bulgaria. Well, Bulgaria, which has paid for deliveries in April, is describing the move as blackmail and is now reviewing all contracts with the company. Greenpeace figures showed the UK has imported around £220 million worth of Russian oil since President Putin started the invasion of Ukraine. Well, meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss will urge allies to send tanks and warplanes to Ukraine. She's making a major speech tonight and she's going to say defence spending needs to be increased and that the West should prepare for the long haul to ensure Russia is defeated. She'll also call for tougher economic sanctions. Influential terrorist prisoners will be isolated as part of plans to stop them radicalising other inmates. An independent government review of jails in England and Wales found that extremist prisoners may be held in high regard by other Muslim inmates. Prison staff have reported that some terror offenders had their cells cleaned by other inmates. The editor of The Mail on Sunday has declined a request from the common speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, to discuss a recent article about the Labour deputy leader. So Lindsay asked for a meeting after an anonymous Conservative MP claimed that Angela Rayner had used her legs to try to distract the Prime Minister in the Commons. Well, the editor, David Dillon, says journalists must be free to report what they're told by MPs and should not take instruction from officials. P&O has resumed Dover Calais freight services for the first time since it sacked nearly 800 workers with no notice last month. The spirit of Britain crossed the channel after previously being detained by the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency after safety issues were found. You're now up to date on GB News. We'll keep you up to date across the day. We're on your TV online and DAB Plus Radio. Now let's head over to Tom for this morning's briefing. Good morning, it's 9.33 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and on your radio. First this morning, with a cabinet round table yesterday seeking solutions to the cost of living crisis coupled with Ukraine and a row over Angela Rayner's legs, what on earth will Sir Keir Starmer choose to berate the Prime Minister with at today's Prime Minister's Questions? Well, joining me now is Gawain Towler, political commentator and consultant to the Reform Party. Uh, welcome to the programme, Gawain. Um, what would... <laughs> Sorry about my hair. <laughs> That's quite all right. It seems like you're outside and windy for those listening on radio. Um, first of all, what would you pick if you were leader of the opposition to ask Boris Johnson 
this afternoon. You Oh, I believe we're having some slight technical problems. The last there. few months. Oh, no, we're, we're back. Gwen, do start yeah. again. You've got to start with basic instincts. What we've seen, uh, we have less and less politics and more and more flim-flam. This is personality-driven, but it embarrasses and causes the, the government difficulty. It's got nothing to do with running the country or the situation or trade or war. But let's talk about basic weapons. I'm afraid I think we might have to we might have to try and re-establish that connection there because that is a, a little bit of a dodgy line. We'll come back to you, Gawain, but for now let's move on to our next story today. Uh, in Britain, the country's main supplier of NHS ambulances has suspended normal production, switching to convert armoured vehicles into ambulances for use in Ukraine. The Venari Group in East Yorkshire has already converted 50 former British military vehicles with more expected. Now our security editor Mark White has this report. Inside this vast facility they're working flat out. A Yorkshire ambulance manufacturer now playing its part in the Ukrainian war effort. But these are no ordinary ambulances. They are specially converted former British military armoured vehicles, providing Ukrainian medics with far better protection in the conflict zone. The company, Venari, normally supplies the vast majority of UK ambulances. But all that's on hold, as everyone here is desperate to help Ukraine. Something that we've seen on this project, like no other, is that the guys are coming from the homes where they've been watching the news with the war unfolding. And for them and for myself and, and for all of us, uh, it doesn't seem to be business at the minute. This is personal. And the guys are building with that personal edge to them. They're working through the break times. They're starting an hour earlier without clocking in. They're, they're finishing later with, you know, whilst clocking out before. You know, we, we're all putting in over and above. You know, it's nothing by comparison to what the Ukrainians are doing on a daily basis. Less than a month after they started this process, the company has already converted around 50 armoured vehicles into ambulances. The first 15 have now been delivered, driven to the region by Venari staff and handed over to Ukrainian medics. The Ukrainian authorities tell us they've been losing around 15 ambulances a day in the conflict. So these specially designed armoured ambulances, better able to resist gunfire and explosions, have never been more urgently needed. At the very least, the Russians have been indiscriminate in their targeting. But many Ukrainians claim their medics have, in some instances, been deliberately targeted. Earlier this month, this former NHS ambulance was badly damaged by shell fire outside a hospital in southern Ukraine. The loss of ambulances has forced locals to use completely unsuitable vehicles to transport the injured. An ambulance is, is a good piece of kit and it's designed to do its job. But take away that infrastructure, take away the safety and add in maybe sniper fire and maybe close on explosions and the, the rugged terrain of a conflict zone and you've now got the perfect vehicle to do that. It was Conservative MP Andrew Percy, himself a volunteer paramedic, who came up with the idea of giving these ex-military vehicles a new lease of life. You know, they were all in their battle, you know, army green with the uh, cam webbing on it, the camouflage webbing, and, and they had the spent shells. So these vehicles have seen action in Afghanistan, uh, you know, surplus to requirements. Uh, you know, and now being reprofiled in this way. And they are sadly needed. The fact that you need to have armoured ambulances is in itself uh, a bit sad, really. And it, 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 it speaks to the aggression with which the Russians are attacking Ukraine. Every day, more of these ambulances roll out of this plant en route to Ukraine. Private donations and government grants should ensure dozens more are converted and sent off in the weeks ahead. Mark White, GB News, Ghoul in East Yorkshire. And I'm delighted to say that Mark White now joins us all the way from Ghoul in East Yorkshire to here in the studio in Paddington in London. Not Mark, by armoured ambulance. <laughs> not by armoured ambulance. This is, these are really incredible uh, vehicles. And, and looking at what the Ukrainians have been using at the start of this conflict, it's going to be a real step up in terms of how the Ukrainian 
uh, health professionals can treat people in that country. Yeah, it's a game changer. And the good thing to see as well is it's a new lease of life for vehicles that served the British military well in Afghanistan and Iraq that had really reached the end of their service life, now being uh, redeployed, uh, marked up, of course, and re-kitted out to work as ambulances. And they are going into a conflict zone where, at the very least, the Russian fire is indiscriminate. Some of the medics out there say they believe they've been deliberately targeted mm. by Russians. And they're driving about in unarmoured ambulances, which means that if they're struck by a small arms fire or caught up in an explosion, then the outcome is not good. These vehicles are much more robust. They can, uh, to a large degree, cope with small arms fire, uh, close-in explosions. And, of course, they're very rugged, big chass chassis, uh, able to go over the kind of terrain that you get in a conflict zone where the normal streets have been blown out, there's rubble everywhere. So they really are a game-changer. They will be able to help. There's 50 of them, Tom, mm. that, have gone, that have gone through the manufacturing process already, 15 already now in Ukraine, wow. the others heading out there, and they're confident and hopeful that they'll be able to get more in the way of finance to develop more of these ambulances. And these are likely to go right to the front line yeah. uh, out, out in, the, in, in the Donbass and in the, in the south of the country as well. How quickly does it take to get an ambulance all the way from the north of England down to the east of Ukraine? Well, it's a few days transit to, to get across there and to get to the Eastern European uh, countries like Poland and across the border mm -hmm into Ukraine. And yes, these vehicles will go right up to uh, the worst of the fighting to be able to, to deal with that. In addition to that, though, the UK and other countries are also sending medical supplies and help. In fact, uh, just yesterday, they announced another 20 NHS ambulances. So not armoured ambulances, but ambulances that NHS trusts have to renew after every five years or so. They reach the point where they're either put into reserve or they're sold on. Mm. Uh, well, a few NHS trusts have been able to donate their surplus ambulances, mm. 20 so far going out to Ukraine, that, that... along with 5 million individual pieces of medical aid as well. It's interesting because we do hear that the ambulance waiting times in this country have been getting stretched, that there are big demands on the NHS in this country. How does an NHS trust make the decision that a piece of equipment is OK to donate and it won't affect the services here at home? Well, it's a calculation, but we're talking about the vehicles. So the vehicles get replaced through a cycle anyway mm. to make sure that they're no older than about five years old, so that they're reliable, they're not breaking down. Uh, they are the very best and fittest for the job. Mm. So the people that would be in these vehicles are the paramedics. So, yeah, you can argue there's a shortage of paramedics, but the vehicles I think they're OK with. There is a reserve mm. of vehicles as well. The same with the fire service. Uh, there are surplus fire engines that when they get to the end of their normal life cycle, they're put in reserve or sold off. Mm. Well, they, uh, dozens of them have been sent out to Ukraine as well. It's all really being, uh, la you know, um, used and uh, gratefully received by the Ukrainians. Uh, and it's not just Britain. Other countries, other Western mm. allies are doing exactly the same. So they're, they're getting a lot of help, but, you know, by God, they need it. Well, Mark White, thank you so much for bringing us that report. Really interesting to see British manufacturing there on the front lines of the war in Ukraine. Well, now let's move on to our next story today. In 2020, of course, we left the European Union. We instituted a points-based migration system a year later. And now the number of migrants entering the UK this year will be higher than it was in 2016. At the same time, fascinatingly, as many who campaigned to leave the EU argued at the time, I should add, public concern about migration since the vote has fallen. Could it be that the British public is wiser than many have given them credit for? Controlling immigration, selecting for language ability and skill is not always the same as reducing immigration. So has taking back control really in, in this sense potentially made us more united. Well, joining us now is Sundar Kurtwala, the director of the British Future Think Tank. Uh, welcome to the programme. I've seen some of your tweets on this issue, and it does seem remarkable, the shift in attitudes of the British people. Uh, what do you put it down to? 
Well, I think, firstly, we started off with a system where there was a lack of confidence in how governments had handled immigration, and that was a big part of that referendum. We'd had large amounts of immigration that hadn't been planned for, hadn't been well managed. It wasn't that people didn't like Polish people who came to this country, but they didn't think governments had got a grip. And also we had a debate where people said, we're not even allowed to talk about that, or we get closed down. I think what's happened with that take back control argument is you can't say we can't talk about it anymore. We've had a big debate, a referendum, and we've changed the system, that there's a new points-based system, not free movement. So in that sense, many Leave voters have definitely got what they want from the Prime Minister. But the Prime Minister always had the view that it wasn't one size fits all, and that he wanted to be more open to students, more open to people who want to stay after they graduate, and more open to non-EU, while cutting out some of the lower paid EU migration that people are worried about. So if people wanted control without reducing it, they've got that from Boris Johnson. But actually, because of other decisions, the Hong Kong visa has come in because of the repression in China and people holding British passports. We've got 100,000 people who have applied to that. And then the public have pressed for this new policy for Ukraine, which is probably more open than the government was going for, but it's very popular. So um, because of the specific decisions that the Prime Minister has made, um, you know, more control over low-skilled EU migration, and um, but more more migration where they've chosen to have it. The public agree with those decisions, but might be a little bit surprised that it all adds up to higher, not lower immigration. Yes, I suppose there is a sort of greater deal of, of iterative consent in that way. Most people agree that we should absolutely take those people fleeing the Chinese Communist Party uh, from Hong Kong, equally the big support for, for Ukrainians, but, but also the high-skilled migrants, particularly we're looking at a, potentially a big trade deal with India this very year, potentially more Indian heart surgeons and tech titans. This seems to be the kind of migration that people are relatively comfortable with, particularly if it comes with a good standard of English. Yes, it's, so it's not one size fits all. And so when we look at the specific decisions, actually, the decisions the government are making on, on work and study fit with where the public are. I still think there's a challenge, because go back to what, what, you know, what went wrong with the large amounts of immigration was that you know, government didn't have its eye on the ball. So even if you thought you know, it, it will be good. It wasn't being managed fairly for the communities that people joined. I think if a government is going to choose short-term high numbers of refugees from Ukraine, they've got the public support there and the, you know, pub people are hosting and that that's good, but we'll need the support to do that. The Hong Kong migration is, you know, is very popular, but it, it's also a large flow. So I think we've got to do something we didn't do in the past, which is focus on integration, focus on contact, focus on the support people need, because I think we've muddled through in the past with immigration, we didn't really focus on integration as much. And if we're going to have an era of selecting relatively high immigration rather than trying to drive the numbers down, which you know was a promise that was made and never kept in the last decade, that's why Boris Johnson ditched that promise. It wasn't a numbers game. I think we've got to work harder on managing the pressures well, maybe spreading the gains about. You don't want everybody to go to the London and the South East. You want the benefits of you know people who are coming, creating jobs made from Hong Kong, going to, you know, going across the country. So I think there's still work to do. But it's very interesting that the argument that it was more about control than about the actual number seems to be borne out by the evidence so far. It's a really fascinating story. Just finally, in this conversation, Sundar Kutwala, what should those policies, those specific policies be to foster that sense of, of Britishness, of integration for those who choose to make their lives here? I think the two big things we could do, one is we're quite agnostic about whether people become citizens or not. And I think we should actually encourage it. You know, we've got a lot of Europeans settled in this country. We should make an offer. Maybe the Prime Minister should write to them all and say, have you considered it? Because that sense of people becoming British, going through citizenship ceremony, it's not right for everybody. But I think, it, you know, people, people find it meaningful. And I think it gives people confidence in the choice that people have made. There's another massive opportunity in the what's happened with homes for Ukraine. It's been very frustrating about people trying to get the visas through and so on. But that, that surge of people coming forward, that was the tip of the iceberg. And many, many more people would like to turn up and do something, have contact, 
conversations. And so I think we could speed up the amount of contact if we if we untap that. At the moment, I think if you're in a faith group, you probably hear about opportunities to do that. Other people, you know, they might not have room in their house, but they'd like to be part of a community group that yeah. gets to know people, helps them settle in, talks to, you know, helps with the children and so on. I think we should unleash that public energy so that there's more contact, more understanding earlier from the people who join our society and, the, and their neighbours. Really, really fascinating stuff there. Control and integration being the watch watchwords for a potentially very generous system going forward. Sundar Kotwala, Director of British Future, thank you very much for joining us this morning on the briefing. Really, really interesting stuff there. Now, finally today, as has been widely reported this week, tech billionaire and the world's richest man, Elon Musk, is purchasing Twitter. Yes, he intends the service to return to its founding principles, once again becoming a town square, a public platform that does not seek to editorialise content, rather allow legal speech to be shared freely. Yet this vision, one that has delighted so many people and, in fairness, has terrified some enough to abandon the platform as well, may not simply apply to the UK at all. Why? Well, it's all down to new legislation going through Parliament right now, entitled the Online Safety Bill. And here in the studio to explain is tech expert and head of public policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Matthew Lesh. Uh, welcome to the programme, Matthew. Uh, would the Online Safety Bill, what would it mean for Twitter in the UK? Look, uh, quite frankly, the Online Safety Bill is a massive roadblock to Elon Musk's plan to make Twitter a free speech platform. It requires the companies to proactively monitor and censor their uh, platforms for things that could be reasonably likely to believe are illegal. And um, that includes things like hate speech. There are also additional duties around this uh, quite terrible idea of notion of legal but harmful speech, including disinformation. Now, we don't know exactly what that's going to include, but we've heard a, a Labor shadow secretary say it should include climate denial. We've obviously had a lot of discussion about COVID relating to these concepts. And it's all about the, the entire purpose of this bill is to put pressure onto companies mm. to be less open and free. So, so despite this uh, purchasing of Twitter, this sort of free speech move made by Elon Musk. What you're saying is actually Twitter might move in the opposite direction in the UK. Content that is currently allowed on that platform, the government, the British government, might force that off despite the free speech direction of the platform. I think that's absolutely right because it creates these duties. So let's go into an example here. Let's get, let's get really into the weeds. One of the things this bill does is it creates a new offence, what it calls a, a harmful communications offence. And that makes it unlawful for anyone to send a message that causes serious distress mm. to a likely audience without a reasonable I, excuse. I think we have a screenshot of the part of the legislation for those listening, uh, for, those, for those watching on television, I should say, uh, pointing to how uh, the risk of harm, and harm is defined as any psychological harm as mm. well, that risk could remove content. That's absolutely right. And then it creates a, a duty on the platforms that, that effectively lowers that threshold. So anything they reasonably believe could be likely to cause serious distress. Now, what that does, in combination with the threat of massive fines for these platforms, is it basically says if you don't like what someone says, if you feel distressed, or if you're a malicious actor who wants to get some speech removed from the platform, you make a claim that this is seriously distressing you, that you want this taken off Twitter. And Twitter would be uh, obliged, under the threat of these massive fines, under the risk of, of criminal sanctions if they don't do as Ofcom tells them, mm -hmm. um, to, to take down that content. It is a recipe for censorship. And I believe we just have one more screenshot of this bill as well to show those watching on television, which talks about what people may reasonably consider to be illegal. Now, that seems to be very subjective and not really a legal test, but one on companies themselves. Yeah, look, let's take the example of uh, the hate crime offences. At the moment, in order to prosecute, the Attorney General has to approve it, you then go to a criminal trial, and, and there's, a, there's proper free speech protections. Now, what this does is it gets rid of the, the beyond reasonable doubt standard and just says if, you, if the companies believe it could be illegal, they reasonably have a suspect it could be illegal, to remove it. Now, that creates an impetus to remove speech rather than host speech, and that's mm. the opposite of what Elon Musk is wanting to do with Twitter. That's really interesting, that impetus to remove speech. I want to run through some examples now as to tweets that uh, I've found, things that have been on Twitter, that are currently sitting on Twitter that are fine uh, in the eyes of Twitter. The, I want to ask you, would they be uh, removed? The first one here, someone tweeting, uh, upon the purchasing of Twitter by Elon Musk, trans women aren't women. 
Would that be allowed on Twitter? Well, I think if you're a trans person, you might have uh, a claim to make to Twitter to say, I find this deeply psychologically offensive. It's questioning who I am. There's no reasonable excuse for that. You can make a claim. And then it would be the impetus on Twitter to remove that content or, as I said, face these massive fines. Now, here's another example. It's something that was written by the Prime Minister. Um, it says, it's absolutely ridiculous that people should choose to go around looking like letterboxes. Now, this was part of a wider column that the Prime Minister wrote several years ago in The Telegraph uh, about uh, the, the burqa. Do you think that Twitter would feel compelled to remove that? Well, ironically, of course, there's this claim that it's going to protect news content. So whilst um, you might be able to post that Telegraph article, if you tweeted that same thing personally, the duties would come on and you as an individual, just as a regular Joe blog, could almost certainly face a claim from someone who uh, wears a burqa that that's extremely offensive, that's not necessarily part of debate, um, and that there's no reasonable excuse. And then, the, again, the impetus would be on Twitter to remove that kind of speech. And, in fact, we've already seen Facebook, when, when Big Brother watched the test, they, they put up precisely that tweet from a random account and mm. Facebook removed it. But we're going to see a lot more of those kind of removals under the online safety bill. That's remarkable. Now, the person pushing through this legislation through Parliament, Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries, has got a long history on Twitter. Here's something she tweeted back in 2013. Be seen within a mile of my daughter and I will nail your balls to the floor. Now, that's, um, that's uh, using your front teeth, I should add. I, I mean, would that, would that be allowed on Twitter or otherwise? Well, look, I, I think it's a great irony that Nadine Doris, someone who uses robust language um, and claims to support free speech, is putting forward this kind of legislation. Now, I think that would be a reasonable case to remove under any circumstances. It's probably a threat of violence. But I think it's exactly this point here, which is, the, again, the impetus will always be on Twitter to remove content, mm. um, no, matter, no matter what happens mm. under this bill. So just finally, uh, here's an example I found this week of someone saying, um, I think I've got Will Smith syndrome. I'm watching Tom Harwood on GB News and have an overwhelming desire to punch his face in. Now, I, I don't mind that tweet being uh, online, but would, would Twitter feel compelled to remove it? Well, I, I would say it's everyone's God-given right to criticise Tom Harwood as much as they like. <laughs> uh, others, of course, might, might disagree, in particular Tom Harwood. But... <laughs> I, I think it's a question here. Again, it's, it's, it could cause you distress. In fact, what's interesting about uh, the, the new communication offence, it doesn't actually have to have caused someone distress, just a likely audience distress. Mm. So even if you personally say, I'm not, I don't care about that very much, again, the impetus would be on Twitter to remove mm. the content. Now, we've only got 20 seconds left in the programme, unfortunately. But in your view, what happens then? If the British government is saying this stuff should be presumed to be removed from Twitter and Elon Musk is saying Twitter should be for free speech, who wins and what happens? Look, ultimately what I worry about is that you could end up in a circumstance where a platform like Twitter or potentially some smaller platforms decide it's just not worth doing business in the UK, that they don't want to face regulatory risk, they don't want to be fined. We saw this under GDPR where there were over a thousand news websites that blocked European users because they didn't want to have to comply with GDPR restrictions. We've got this new piece of legislation that could result in much less access to content online by British users. I don't know what would specifically happen in a standoff with Elon Musk. It would depend how aggressively he wants to fight and, and how the decisions Ofcom makes. But it really does worry me that the UK could be really um, re reducing access to information, reducing free speech online. Well, it's a really fascinating issue and no doubt one that will run and run. Matthew Less, thank you so much for talking us through the weeds of that particular legislation going through Parliament at the moment. Well, that's it for the show today. Coming up, it's to the point. But first, here's the weather. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. It's a chilly start out there this morning, but actually most places are dry, most places are bright, and it's a day of sunny spells for the vast majority. High pressure clearly dominating our weather at the moment. It's drifting in from the north, so we've still got a bit of a chilly easterly breeze around the southern flank of that high, but with high pressure in place, light winds, clear skies, and as a result, a touch of frost in places as we start the day. But soon enough, with the sunshine, it will start to feel more pleasant as temperatures rise. It's still going to be a bit colder along the east coast of Scotland and northern England. But with less cloud compared to yesterday, actually, it's going to be pleasant enough this afternoon. Highs in Newcastle and Hull of 9 to 10 Celsius. Cardiff, Southampton, 14 degrees. Belfast, 12 degrees. So those temperatures are a little lower compared to the last couple of days. But I think for many, with the sunny skies, and the light winds, it's going to be a fine day. Still some cloud drifting around, as will be the case overnight. Parts of northern Scotland will see a few showers and across central Scotland, some patchy cloud, likewise across the Midlands and East Anglia. Now away from the cloud, with again light winds and cold air in place, 
a widespread frost is expected in sheltered parts of the country. But once again, despite the chill tomorrow morning, plenty of blue skies out there first thing. Still some cloud floating here and there, particularly for eastern and central parts of England, perhaps northern Scotland. But plenty of places will just see sunny spells and it will stay dry. 14 to 15 Celsius, southern England, south Wales, 10 to 12 for northern England, 13 there for Glasgow, 12 for Belfast. Into Saturday, well, it stays